Um, it's Peter Anderson from Vocalize. Um, and his, his talk's called An Opportunity Within the Crisis and How We Might Get There. Peter's been working on solutions to help bring about a positive transition in society for over a decade. Starting back in 2003 with Localize, aiming to become a comprehensive resource management system for local communities. The primary focus for the past five years or so has been to establish a core component of the Localize toolkit called Vocalize. This being a process for local decision making, crowdsourcing projects and scaling benefit through replication. Would you please welcome Peter Anderson. Thanks very much and um, very well organised James because really this follows on perfectly from um, Joe's talk really a lot of the work that I'm doing is inspired by the transition initiative and I was in heavily involved in it uh, a decade or so ago when Rob Hopkins brought it in but I could see that transition in itself was um, faced with numerous problems um, such as actually transitioning a town, a whole town, to a sustainable future. One of the um, main issues that they face is engaging the wider audience. So you'll get the core group, the 100 or 200 people that come to the initial meetings, and then it's a case, well, how do we broaden that out to the whole town, which actually exists of potentially tens of thousands of people? Um, so that's kind of... Um, what I've been working on, but uh, let me just start off by giving some recognition to the Zeitgeist films. Anybody seen a Zeitgeist film here? Anybody not seen a Zeitgeist film here? I would definitely recommend you do it. For me, it was you know a real paradigm shift. It was a real moment in my life. I, um, I kind of some of the things, the myth-busting stories that they put forward were. Um, I've changed my life really and I've delighted in telling a lot of these stories to especially men in, men in the cloth and Jehovah's Witnesses and this sort of stuff, especially the story um, around the Son of God, you know, and the concept that the Son of God might not be this mythical character but it actually might be this great yellow ball in the sky. It was the first sort of face palm moment for me um, that, uh, you know, that... Um, I concede that that might be a possibility and then the whole biblical story that that might be underpinned by a celestial story um, that the sun dying and dying for three days might be or coincide with the celestial bodies um, and dying on the southern cross and the three kings and all this sort of thing so if you, haven't, if you don't know that story um, then I certainly recommend that you look into it so thanks to Peter Joseph and all of his great work for, for that and um, as you know, um, Peter Joseph was also advocating for a global resource management system, which made a lot of sense to me, in terms of how can we manage our uh, world sustainably, how can we create a sustainable world, unless we know what resources we've got. And this very much resonated with a project that I'd been working on already uh, for about two or three years by the time that film came out, which was called Localize. The idea of Localize was really to create a comprehensive community management system. So many of you will know of websites that do similar things to these components here, which are about maybe carbon footprinting and sharing <coughs> skills and car sharing, um, buying, selling, swapping, free cycling, this sort of thing. But what didn't exist was a comprehensive resource that actually had all of these tools in one where the data could cross-pollinate and that could then create a you know, really useful tool for communities to use in the process of transition. And that tool still doesn't exist today. Um, so that's still a challenge that we need to do. And really my approach was to, do, to build this from the local level, um, from communities upwards and layer by layer, um, as you can see here. So that, was, that occupied me for, for several years and we uh, won several awards here from um, Nesta and Unlimited and WCVA and what have you. And in 2008 was sort of a pinnacle for me. Um, we were nominated for a Revolutionary Award by number 10 um, here and uh, talk about highs and lows at the beginning of the week. That we, uh, I met uh, Gordon Brown and was um, given the Revolutionary Award. And at the end of the week, the doctor called up and said, uh, the reason why you haven't been feeling too well for the past sort of four or five years is because you've got kidney failure. So that led me on to a personal journey of 
having a kidney transplant and what have you. And I needed to sort of really reevaluate my own personal relationship with the localised project at that point because it's obviously a massive undertaking. But I just want to say at this point that the localised project has legs, you know, and it w can be backed and will be backed with the right support and the right capacity by normal funds, you know, the big lottery funds, these sort of government funding, they're, they're prepared to accept that. So it doesn't have to be a fringe movement. But for me personally, I needed to um, sort of re-evaluate that and make things a bit simpler. And around that time, as around 2008, the transition initiative was, was gaining momentum. Um, and they were sort of recognising the, all of these different crises that we're faced with. And some of you may have seen the film The Age of Stupid. And they were obviously advocating that where we're heading for is actually a mass extinction event. So it's all pretty depressing. But the optimist in me was saying, well, if uh, the mass extinction event is the crisis, then what is the potential solution? And I think really that's uh, one of the things that probably resonates with most people in this room is you're thinking about what is a potential opportunity. And having given this some, quite a lot of thought myself, maybe something like an earth cooperative, something where we have um, local ownership and where we achieve some sort of biosphere balance might be somewhere where we can get to. But the real question is not what we vision that to be. It's really, I think, one of the key challenges is how we actually get there. And I think it's one of the things that the Transition Town Movement and the Zeitgeist Movement have really struggled with in terms of what are the practical steps to actually getting there. So... If you go to um, lectures and conferences uh, from people in the know, you'll hear these statements, climate change is a social justice issue. That's quite interesting, you know, climate change isn't just an environmental issue that we need to do environmental tasks to solve climate change, we actually need to solve social justice. So that was kind of a, a new paradigm for me, and the people in power find it difficult to make unpopular decisions. So... They were saying that the solutions actually lie in grassroots democracy, grassroots engagement, community empowerment, this sort of thing. Because it's only collectively, through our collective action and our collective voice, that we make the change. So this is kind of a deeper, um, a deeper root cause of the issues that we see today. And not necessarily an obvious one for a lot of people. So, personally, when I heard these repeatedly from these different speakers, I said to myself, well, what's the most basic question I could ask myself? What, is, what does local democracy look like today in the UK? And if you ask yourself that question, you'll find a structure of wards. There's 10,000 wards in the country, and we've got ward councillors that make decisions on our behalf. Now, let me ask you here, how many people here think they know which ward they live in? Okay, so maybe, maybe half. So if the solution to the global crisis is grassroots democracy and only half of you know which ward you live in, that to me is sort of an elephant in the room. It's a fundamental problem that we've got to resolve. And so if you actually talk to the community councils, the uh, community councillors who are representing us, these are the sort of statements that I would get back. Uh, they have little or no dialogue with the wider community, and most of their decisions are based on guesswork. And that's not necessarily through any fault of their own, but what are the mechanics for those councillors to actually have a dialogue with the wider community? So this was you know, becoming more and more apparent to me in terms of why we're not necessarily making the progress that we want to make. Also, local people find it difficult to get projects off the ground, to self-organise, because if you've got a good idea... How do you know how much support there's going to be? You know, without going out with clipboards and doing paper-based surveys and this sort of things, how do you know if there's going to be enough support? And the typical business model is to open up a shop with one customer and then maybe three years later you might break even. And you know, that's a very risky and stressful thing to do. So local democracy is somewhat of a black hole. And that's kind of a paradox considering how much voting we actually see on TV. Yeah, almost every Saturday night, almost all programmes have some sort of digital voting incorporated in them. So that was really 
the challenge that we decided, or I decided to focus on with Vocalize. And what we also realised was that the local resource management system would come to fruition if this project comes to fruition, because people will prioritise the tools that they need in their community to make that transition, whether it's uh, wanting to be able to calculate the carbon footprint or to be able to skill share more or better access to local resources. So the, the real challenge, and one we can take on ourselves, is to be able to amplify our collective voice at the local level. And this isn't just about single campaigns that you might do with 38 degrees. This is about having a comprehensive voice under all the different topics and the topics that you'd find under transition, you know, um, whether that's transport or economy or health and well-being, this sort of thing. Because uh, at the moment, you know, the communities where you live, we can't pull down a report of what those priorities are. So imagine the impact that if there was a really strong voice there in terms of your collective priorities in your communities, how that would affect the representatives that represent you. Um, that would give them a lot more information to be able to make decisions and also how that would affect direct action. So just to define here really the two different types of democracy that we've got. We've got your representative democracy and you've got direct democracy. Okay. And as you know, most projects have got some sort of tipping point. And you, you see projects like uh, Kickstarter and this sort of thing, um, and uh, different campaigns. Once they reach a certain level, then most things can get off the ground. Um, we've seen some amazing progress uh, and some amazing movements, which really combine um, the the political or uh, transitional energy of, of a group of people married with a digital tool. And I think this is one of the fundamental uh, areas that a lot of groups miss and don't talk about, especially in transition. You don't necessarily hear people saying, which digital tool are we going to use to make the change that we want to see? Certainly in a lot of the environmental groups and this sort of thing, because people are intrinsic and community focused, the word technology is almost a no-go. Um, but the reality is, is a lot of the big changes we've seen in society today have been where these groups have picked up a digital tool and they've used it to great effect. So you might have heard of the Podemos party in Spain um, who've been using a tool called Lumio uh, for about a decade. The Red Party in Argentina went from nothing to um, being elected in around four months by using Democracy OS. And in Iceland they use a, a tool called um, your priorities after they went bankrupt um, to try to create a new citizen's constitution. And you'll probably, many of you will be subscribed to Avaz and 38 Degrees around, uh, around single issue campaigning. But the question is what's happening at the local level? What, is the, what are the tools that we can use at the community and district level to really make those changes? And many of you will be fans or have been watching Russell Brand. This is exactly what he's advocating for, that we should be coming together in our communities and workplaces and identifying what our local priorities are. And more recently, Jeremy Corbyn's been saying exactly the same. Yeah, so I see a lot of people coming together to try and get Jeremy Corbyn elected, but I don't see so many people actually focusing on what Jeremy Corbyn's asking us to do which is to come together and identify these priorities and actually create a movement, a grassroots movement. So even if we were to come together, say for instance some of you took the initiative and you arrange, um, start some community consultations, this is what it tends to look like, yeah? Thousands of post-it notes or big sheets of paper or paper tablecloths and it's very difficult to use this process and come up with an effective, efficient strategy. I'm sure many of us have been to consultation events like this. And the engagement of a traditional consultation tends to look a bit like a heartbeat. There's nothing for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden someone puts a lot of energy into it, there'll be a lot of um, engagement, a few events, and then nothing again. Certainly in Pembrokeshire, where I live, there's an organisation that does this, and they create 10-year strategy plans on, the, on this basis. And obviously today things are moving so quickly, we need something that's a lot more dynamic. And there's no digital component to those consultations whatsoever. So these are the problems that Vocalizer uh, is, is trying to solve. So Vocalizer is an advanced decision-making 
and crowdsourcing tools. So initially around your uh, opinions and ideas, and secondly around your commitment to make projects happen. So the three things we really want to try and do is to be able to enable communities and organisations and stakeholder groups to be able to rate and debate ideas to identify their clear strategy and priorities. That's the first thing, and that's kind of really where we're at at the moment. The second and third elements here are kind of aspirational. This is the journey that we're on. But the second element is to be able to take those priorities, once you know what they are, and then break them down into projects that can be crowdsourced and turn them into tangible projects uh, in the community. And thirdly, then, and the most importantly, is the ability then to replicate those projects. And I believe it's, it's this bit, that if we can master this, that we can create a route map in our own minds as to how we create a sustainable future, if we can replicate the best projects. So the question that we can ask ourselves is how can we improve? How can we improve the, demo um, the economy? How can we improve health and well-being? How can we improve the community or our organisation? Any one of you could start this conversation in your community or in your organisation. And we've all got solutions, and you may well have heard of solutions already, and you know, the, the, the sort of ideas that we just heard from Transition Town, if we, could, um, uh, if we could replicate those ideas into every village and district across the country, we'd be making some serious impact. Yeah? And if you watch things like TED, um, these sorts of program, uh, internet programs, then you will, may have well have seen the advance of Bitcoin and vertical farming and 3D printing and solar farms. Yeah, so in Malta, for instance, you can go on a course and pay by Bitcoin to learn about cryptocurrencies. Yet the, the universities that I'm working with, I haven't met one accountancy student that has even heard of a cryptocurrency. So what is the process of getting a cryptocurrency course into the university? One of the processes would be for them to run a process like this and to be asking the question, what is it? Or how can we improve teaching and learning? And the students suggest it and rate it and debate it highly. And that then becomes a priority that is turned into action by the student union and the management team. Okay, so it's this, this way that we can replicate these really good ideas into our in towns and communities. So share your ideas and your opinions. And you'll end up then, instead of these mass, huge walls of post-it notes, you'll end up with really clear lists. And this was a, a list of priorities that came out of a small community in Pembrokeshire. The really interesting thing here is that we're just asking, how can we improve the community? But almost all the ideas are green initiatives. Local organic food box scheme being at the top, uh, wind energy, um, stocking fair trade. I mean, Joe, you mentioned a lot of these projects already. So I could have gone in as a transition initiative saying, we need to, you need to do green projects. But actually, if you go in there with a question, <coughs> most people already know the answers. And the, the great thing is that obviously they're starting to take ownership of this. And all my job was, was to publicise these priorities in the local parish magazine so that people could see them. And that was the first time local people saw the priorities for their community. Um, so the real paradigm shift for me was when three weeks later, after publicising those in the parish magazine, this food box scheme started. Because enough people, um, it was evident that enough people wanted the food box scheme, and uh, the, the girl who'd suggested the idea could move forward confidently with it. Otherwise, she just might have been someone who just thought of the idea but was too scared to move forward. So this is what the graph looks like yeah, on, on Vocalise. Once you start the question, it's always increasing in terms of the amount of traction, as opposed to the heartbeat, which is just a small amount of engagement at one time. And this is actually a college um, uh, in, in South Wales who um, have got 11,000 members on the system now, of which 10% have been active in the first four months. So we're seeing not exactly a vertical line, but a, a real huge increase. So the idea of apathy is really not non-existent. If you uh, make it easy for people to participate, you know, and it's a subject that they really want to engage in, then they will. And this was Pembrokeshire College launching a system to underpin institutional planning for their staff. And so normally the, the, the process of getting ideas out of the staff to improve the college is for them to come together in this lecture room and for them to put their hands up and suggest the ideas. So you can imagine how intimidating that might be uh, for people. So in this particular case, they were shown how to use the system and then they were mandated to go back to their desk for an hour and a half 
and engage in the process. And obviously that was a, a, you know, a, a bit of a, a brow wiping um, moment for me, but um, within six weeks of that process, the, they'd identified £28,500 worth of savings. And that was just people saying, suggesting maybe use a digital service instead of a, instead of a paper-based service and things like this. So, um, you know, there was real tangible outcomes as, as a result of that process. The first university actioned over 40 ideas in the first six months, and they ended up with the highest increase in the National Student Survey that, that year, the first year that they used it. Because usually the student survey, it survey is the first time students are asked about the process, and they usually get asked, um, uh, how do you feel listened to? But yet this is the first time they've had a chance to actually answer the survey. So vocalised runs throughout the year, and then when they get asked, do they feel listened to? It's a different response. Um, we're not doing this yet, but we can imagine vocalised being an enabler of community share schemes, and also as the benefit funds come off uh, things like the uh, wind turbines and the solar arrays, there's a budgeting pro um, tool that can be used to help distribute those funds to local projects. So as I was saying earlier, really, I think the, one of the things that we really need to get good at is mastering replication. And if we can master the replication of all the great projects that we see in the world, then we'll make tangible progress. And we've been part of the um, Assemblies for Democracy for the last six months, and we've been trying to hone down what it is, what is the process that we need to go through to master that replication. And this is what we've come up with so far, really, is to run the process online initially, to run the digital debate, to identify your priorities, publish those in any paper-based media that you've got, whether that's newsletters or... Um, parish magazines or in the local newspapers and the papers are actually really interested in this type of content because it's all user generated and then hold your engagement events to raise more awareness and from the events start forming working groups this is very much the transition model anyway and from your working groups they do the research and the feasibility on the different ideas and they hone and refine the ideas to turn them into crowdsourcing projects that then you can gather the commitment, uh, innovate them, and gather the commitment that you need to turn them into practice. So just some stats from the system so far. Uh, we've got almost a quarter of a million interactions, around 10,000 active members, almost 4,000 ideas, and around 1,000 outcomes to date. So it's, it's early days, and we've got traction in education so far. Clearly we're looking for collaborators and partners and investors um, to, to join us and help us. Um, and anyone that wants to use the process in their own organisation would be willing to, or, or community, would be, be glad to talk to you. So really as a closing statement, the idea of Vocalise is to take the best projects in the world, consider which are appropriate for our communities, and then refine and replicate them to fit our local circumstances. And in that way, hopefully, you can visualise how we might create a sustainable world for future generations. That's it. Thank you. That's it. OK, thank you very much, Peter. Let's grab a couple of questions whilst we get this uh, Wi-Fi situation sorted out for Peter. So. Um, OK. Uh, is there anybody? No? OK, go for it. <laughs> Brilliant idea, love it. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that process of prioritisation? So you went into the college, they went away to their desks and typed in their ideas. Yeah. How are then they, they then grouped and prioritised to sort of get the list out that you came up with? And, and then how do you avoid any bias in the voting where people only vote for the highest priority ideas? Yeah, so, so the topics are already set. In most organisations, you've already got either, uh, in colleges, for instance, you've got learner parliaments, you've got student voice committees. and um, So those people initially start the questions, and those questions might be, uh, you know, how to, just general questions, how to improve the, um, 
the uh, experience for staff or how to improve the experience for students. Um, so those questions are set and they're the topics and then when they go back they, there was a widget installed into the intranet so that there's a single sign-on process, there's no registration process for them. Uh, and they click on that and uh, then they suggest their ideas and obviously every time an idea is suggested an alert goes out to all of the other staff on the system and they all rate and debate each other's ideas. So within half an hour or so, you've got, um, uh, well, you know, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 ideas rated and debated by three or 400 people and divided up into topics, which then gets fed to the staff committee meetings and then they refine those and push them through to SMT for consideration. So it, it, it kind of fits within the existing system, but instead of the learner voice, I don't know if any of you work in education, but I, I think you'll probably hopefully agree that the pupil voice, student voice, student uh, committees, it can be a little bit of a tick boxing exercise. You know, you'll, you'll potentially have 180 representatives inside a college, for instance, and maybe only eight turn up to the, to the representation meeting, you know. And there's no real process of turning ideas into action. Whereas here now, they'll be uh, presented with a list of ideas that will be rated and debated by 800 students. You know, so, um, so there's obviously a real mandate for action at that point. Uh, do we have a, another question? Or, yep, one more at the back there. Is this only uh, for UK? The website? It, it, it works globally. Um, it's more refined for the UK because my plan was to... Because uh, the question is, how do you get people into their communities? So all the wards, all 10,000 wards and the districts and the countries are already in the system. And when people put their postcodes in, they're automatically joined to those three groups. So if any one of you register today, uh, and some of you may already have, have done that, you'll notice you, you're already joined to the three groups, your community, your district and your country. Um, so what was the question again? Oh, does it work for all of the, all of, yeah, so you can register outside of the UK, but it would be nice to do the same thing in the different countries, obviously to translate it and to find that local refinement of democracy, well, how does democracy currently work in the different countries, uh, but we, we would need, you know, sponsorship to be able to, to develop that further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much.